This experience happened to me two days ago from writing this, and it was definitely the strongest psychedelic experience for me, at least so far. Before this, I've had some experience with other substances. I've of course used alcohol and weed, but other ones I have tried have been nutmeg, DXM, magic mushrooms, LSD, LSA, and nitrous. Mostly, I've been using LSD and the strongest trip for me so far was 200 micrograms in weed. Another one was when I took nitrous with LSD and LSA. These experiences have been somewhat strong, but every time I felt like I could have taken more, and none were at the level that this one was. Little background before the story. I'm 20 years old, and the experience took place in my parents' home, where I still live at the time being, moving out in a month, but that isn't very relevant. I had the home to myself for a day, so I decided to brew myself some ayahuasca, using Syrian rue and mimosa hostilis I had ordered. I had tried this brew earlier a week before, when I was seeing friends. That time they brewed it, and the experience was nice, but not very strong. Only differences between their brew and mine was that their ingredients were a little bit older and they didn't add any vinegar into their brew. That time, the effects came up very quickly in about 15 minutes. I vomited around the 30 minute mark and the trip didn't get much stronger. I didn't see much visuals, but I still enjoyed the experience. It felt similar to something like 1.5 grams of magic mushrooms. This time, I followed the same recipe, except I used my own ingredients and added the vinegar. I decided to make three doses, so I used 18 grams of mimosa hostilis root bark and six grams of Syrian rue. I added some more Syrian rue because I almost boiled it, so it was probably closer to eight grams of Syrian rue. I boiled both of them for four hours and bottled them. The mimosa hostilis brew was around 800 milliliters and the Syrian rue one was around 250 milliliters. I dosed around a third of both liquids and decided to leave the two other doses for later. I was expecting a similar experience to last time, maybe a little bit stronger, since I was planning on trying to not vomit as early. I first drank the Syrian rue at around 9.40pm. I had set up a laptop, some candy to mask the taste, a bucket for purging, and headphones for music. 20 minutes later at 10pm, I started drinking the Mimosa Hostilis drink. Both drinks tasted awful. I had drunk around half of the 200 milliliter drink in 10 minutes and I was already starting to feel some effects. The effects were very minor and were similar to last time. Five minutes later, I had drank three fourths of the drink and this would be all I would drink. I drank around 150 milliliters of the Mimosa Hostilis in total. I had felt some nausea but managed to hold it in. Effects were slowly getting more intense but it wasn't much different from last time. I had some ringing in my ears and that would intensify by getting more pitched up and faster. I found that quite interesting, but it was nothing groundbreaking yet. At 10.30, 30 minutes after drinking the brew, the effects started to intensify fast. At this point, I decided to go purge in a toilet since I didn't want to deal with that while I was tripping balls. I vomited so hard that I got vomit out of my nose. After cleaning that up, I noticed that the vomiting didn't slow down the come up at all. The effects were actually increasing even more rapidly. At this point, I'm starting to get worried as I realize that this trip is going to be a lot stronger than the last one. I sit down and try to calm myself down by watching YouTube, but the effects keep getting stronger. I'm starting to hear these psychedelic sounds that sound distorted and change pitch constantly. It sounded like something from a Spangle song. I try to calm myself down, but I am getting more and more worried since the effects are already many times stronger than the last time and still getting stronger. I lay down and close my eyes in efforts to calm down and just ride it out. As I close my eyes, I start to see closed eye visuals. These were repeating patterns of green and purple things I cannot describe well. There were green particles floating around in purple repeating patterns that weren't geometrical, but instead resembled mouths with their lips pushed together as if they were about to kiss. I start to lose my grip with reality and surroundings. At the same time, I start hearing a pitching sound that sounds like words which I cannot understand. It felt like the mouths were making fun of me and playing with me, which made me even more anxious. I open my eyes and get up as I feel like I'm losing my grip on reality and surroundings and forgetting where I am and what's going on. At this point, I realize that I'm fucked. I ponder what I should do. I decide to try to ride it out, but I know that it's going to be extremely intense and easily a heroic dose trip. I was scared of what I would experience and that it would last for the next five hours. I knew that I was going to spend that time in a completely other realm without any understanding of my surroundings. 
I also knew that I was going to experience ego death, and I felt the presence of an entity, which I imagined to be some god that people see during ayahuasca ceremonies, and that it was going to judge me for my doings. I was extremely anxious at this point, and wondering how this ended up like this. I also remembered that when I was thinking, the voice in my head sounded very different than normally. It was like someone else was thinking my thoughts, and I couldn't recognize some of my thoughts as mine. I can't remember what visuals I saw, since I wasn't really focused on them. I remember at least seeing the room I was in move in a circular motion. I am anxiously getting ready and trying to come to terms with the fact that I was going to be teleported into an entirely different realm and losing touch with reality. I searched calming music on YouTube, which was quite difficult since my hands were shaking from fear and the visuals were obstructing my vision. On top of that, I was starting to forget how to even use YouTube. I get the music playing, lay down, and close my eyes. I am immediately teleported into another realm where I experience the most interesting and beautiful experience of the trip. I was laying in another world where everything looked very yellow and golden. Everything was made from their little golden particles. I was laying in golden grass next to a small stream with transparent or silvery water. Next to me was some young woman sitting and looking at me with a calm expression. She also had golden clothes and quite long golden hair. I think I looked up and saw that the sky was completely black and the whole place I was in was inside a bubble. The place was circular and was maybe 200 meters wide. It was like this golden garden inside a bubble in a space of complete emptiness. I don't remember if something happened after that, but I started to get scared of how fast I was losing my touch with reality and I felt the ego death coming. I had kept my eyes closed for only like 30 seconds and I had already almost lost all touch with reality. After this, I get up and start to really panic and wonder if I should call for help. At this point, it was only around 10.45 p.m., so only 45 minutes had passed. I start to worry about what is going to happen as I am afraid of possible psychological damage such as PTSD or HPPD. I had seen videos on terrifying ayahuasca experiences and think how this feels so cliche. I think to myself that this is exactly how it goes in those videos. I feel the ayahuasca getting even stronger, even though it's already so strong that I cannot comprehend it. I am constantly forgetting everything as the ego death is coming closer. I am constantly forgetting what's going on, then realizing how fucked my situation is, then forgetting it again. I am re-experiencing it all the time in a loop, and every time it feels like my situation is even worse. I also tried to watch a psych substance video to calm myself down, but I couldn't really understand what he was saying and interpreting what he said in a different way. I also couldn't focus much at all because of how uncomfortable I was feeling. At that point, I decided that this needs to stop. I remember that I had a benzo, which was a 5 mg diazepam as a trip killer. I had read before that you shouldn't take benzos with ayahuasca, but at that point I wasn't thinking rationally, and the only thought I had was that this trip needs to end. I wait for the benzo to take effect, but time goes incredibly slow. One minute feels like five minutes. I feel extremely uncomfortable. I was just thinking how did this end up like this? Around 10 minutes pass and the ayahuasca keeps getting stronger. I also had 5 milligrams of aripiprazole which is an antipsychotic. I had read that you shouldn't take antipsychotics with ayahuasca either but at this point I didn't think about that at all. The benzo hadn't even started to take effects yet so there wasn't even a reason to take it but at that state I didn't care. I had earlier sent a message that I was taking ayahuasca to a group chat where the same people I did ayahuasca earlier were in. It was now 11 p.m., so an hour after I took it, and I sent a message that the ayahuasca was too strong. I lay down again to calm down, but this time with my eyes open, so that I wouldn't be in another realm and lose touch with reality. Then I realized that I shouldn't have taken the benzo and the antipsychotic with the ayahuasca, and I start to panic. I was now scared for my safety, and I was wondering if I should call the emergency number. I was worried that if I closed my eyes, I would not only experience ego death, but that I would actually die. I was trying to figure out what to do as I was forgetting things even more. I was constantly wondering if I am in danger and then remember that I took the benzo and antipsychotic and then forget again. I finally gather my thoughts enough and call my friend and explain what's going on. It was now around 11.05 PM, but it had felt like two hours at least, though I didn't have any sense of time at that point. My friend did some googling and I was frantically asking him whether I was going to be okay and if I was going to die. I told him that I was afraid if I closed my eyes I was going to die. He said that I was going to be okay and that I wasn't going to die. 
He said that he was coming to my house with his friend's ride, and I kept asking him when he would get here. I was constantly asking how long it would take, but every time I would forget or not listen to the answer. I finally said that I have asked this a thousand times now, but how long is it going to take for you to be here? Only for him to say that I hadn't asked that even once yet, and I had probably imagined asking him that. This really fucked with my head as I was certain I had asked him that, and even looking back I remember asking him that multiple times. I asked him later what all I said during the phone call. I had apparently said that I was going to lose my mind and that what I was experiencing was hell, though I don't remember that. What I do remember was that as my friend was coming, I was still on a phone call with him. The benzo and antipsychotic were slowly starting to take effect during the call. I said that I keep forgetting stuff and that I couldn't recognize my own voice. It was like I would think of something to say and the voice would say what I think out loud. There also felt to be a delay with what I was thinking to say and what I was saying, which I got very focused on. I remember telling that it feels like I'm just my consciousness, like if my consciousness was uploaded to some kind of matrix without my body or anything. My friend reminded me that this was a part of ego death. This was the closest to complete ego death I would experience, as the benzo and antipsychotic would stop the trip. At around 11.30 p.m., my friend arrives, and at that point, I am already coming down because of the benzo and antipsychotic. I am still tripping a little bit, but it's more on the same level of last time I had tried ayahuasca. I was thinking about what happened earlier, and managed to get to terms with what had happened during that evening. At around 12 a.m., I felt almost normal, but the benzo and antipsychotic did make me very drowsy. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't call my friend, as I was very scared of my well-being. The next day, I felt very tired from the experience and still a bit weird, but now two days later, I feel normal again. I still have two-thirds of the ayahuasca left, but I'm going to save that for later and try with a lot smaller dose. I would be interested to experience some of that again and go into those realms I visited once I am ready. This time, I wasn't expecting, nor ready or prepared for a trip of that magnitude, but once I am ready, I'd want to go back. I feel like I barely escaped from the grips of whatever was pulling me into that world. Update over a year later. This year I've spent a lot of time thinking about this trip. It has opened my eyes to see what life really is and my position in it all. On the other hand, it has also raised some of my anxieties. I no longer really use any substances except alcohol occasionally. I'm not opposed to tripping or smoking weed, but even smoking weed has given me decent amounts of paranoia and it feels too much like what I experienced on ayahuasca. I still feel like I have unresolved stuff I must figure out before tripping again. I'd still like to experience psychedelics at some point, but this time, I want to do it when I am actually ready. I had tripped on LSD at least 50 plus times by this point, my highest dose being 9 tabs. I am also very experienced with a variety of drugs opiates, stimulants, inhalants, psychedelics, dissociatives, benzodiazepines, and quite frankly, anything I can get my hands on. Now, the LSD I had done the previous trips had all been purchased from the same dealer, and even though I had one or two intense trips, mentally I could handle it very well and never felt as if I was in any physical danger, and I really enjoyed tripping on acid. However, on this day, my usual dealer had run out of tabs, and I really wanted a trip, so I ended up finding somebody else in the area who was selling them, advertised as 200 micrograms each, a pretty average dose. I ended up buying two tabs for 20 pounds, 400 micrograms in total. This was nothing crazy because by this point, I had done over 100 micrograms before, and that went very well. Now when it comes to buying drugs off dealers, I admit I'm very naive and don't even contemplate the fact they may sell me something else to make more money. So with that being said, I took both tabs without looking back. I noticed a slightly strange taste which I thought was weird since I've never noticed that before, but with me being so desperate to get high, I honestly didn't care. About 30 minutes passed and I was on the train and I started to feel something. This feeling wasn't a nice feeling at all. In fact, it was an extremely uncomfortable sensation. I felt super dirty in my body and I had a gut feeling that something was going to go wrong this night. However, I just shrugged it off and made myself believe it would go away when I got home. I was very wrong. I arrived home another 30 minutes later, somehow managing to make it upstairs to my room without my parents noticing my pupils were the size of Jupiter. This was when things really took a turn for the worst. 
The best way I can describe it is that everything felt really unnatural and I started to panic. My entire room turned into hell. I started hallucinating Pennywise and an entire army of clowns surrounded me. Everywhere I would turn, they would be there and it was terrifying. I did my best to try to calm myself down but knew this was an impossible task since I thought clowns were trying to murder me. I then got really freaked out when my arms became connected to my legs and felt like my entire soul was being ripped out of my body. Fuck, I thought, I'm actually going to die. I felt insanely overstimulated and my heart was pounding out of my chest faster and harder than ever. My whole body felt very tight too and I couldn't even think straight. I began to enter a loop of staring at my wall repeating the same sentence then snapping out of it like 10 to 15 minutes later. By now I wasn't even peeking and the panic kept increasing. I went downstairs, nearly collapsed halfway down and entered the living room where my dad was sitting in the chair watching TV. He asked if I wanted to watch something with him. Stupidly, I agreed. I must have been acting weirder than usual because he kept asking me questions and I couldn't form a coherent sentence. My dad then asked the fateful question, did you take something? At first, I denied, but after a brief argument, I gave up and said, I think I need to go to the hospital. I'm going to die. My heart rate was now higher than it had ever been. And believe me, I was addicted to cocaine and meth and had done lots of stimulants. However, my heart had never felt this bad before. My dad went to go grab my mom who was trying to sleep at the time and they were going to drive me to the hospital as they thought it would be quicker. I was holding onto my chest while sitting on the couch in pure agony while also shaking and observing the most intense, weird hallucinations I've ever witnessed. By now it had been about two hours and things got out of control now. I managed to get into the car with my dad in the back seat with me and this is when the delirium just hit me. As my mom drove at what felt like 150 miles per hour, I started talking in four different accents at different times. I would switch between an American accent and a very broad Liverpool accent. London and glimpses of myself for seconds coming back to reality. However, that was quickly overridden as my brain was rapidly falling apart. I kept making remarks like, fuck this, just let me die, and countless other things that I can't remember very well as most of what I said on this car journey is a blur. My parents looked genuinely terrified as they had never seen me in a state like this. I had overdosed on Xanax and Oxycodone in the past, but I didn't go insane. This must have been terrifying to watch. I kept forgetting I was even going to the hospital, and when I arrived, it just got scarier. I am only 15 and I was when this happened too, so doctors and nurses take these things a lot more serious when you're still a child, and this was my third trip to A&E in six months. Everyone there must have thought I was such a junkie, and I began to scream and shout, just give me Xanax or inject fentanyl into me so I die quicker, please. I didn't think about anything I said, nor the consequences of what would come after this if I survived. I was put on this bed in a small room, which was terrifying. My heart rate was dangerously high, and so was my blood pressure. I stood up and started screaming. Then I felt like a train crashed into my heart, and I fell to the floor, and I cannot remember anything that happened next. I woke up sometime later early in the morning, still somewhat tripping. Anyone who has ever done 25i NBOME will most likely agree that after four to five hours, the trip is very flat and annoying. I was told I suffered a cardiac arrest and was lucky to be alive. My blood pressure was now very, very low and I wasn't allowed to leave until 48 hours or something later. It was hell and now I was re-enrolled in all the psychiatry services, etc. And my parents were beyond disappointed with me. It was one of the most intense nights of my life and to anyone wanting to do LSD, Please test your tabs and be safe. If I said I didn't do NBOME ever again, that would be a lie sadly, but I certainly never did more than one of those tabs. December 30th, 2019. I had just flown home after a three month stint in a Florida rehab for Kratom, Adderall, and alcohol. I had put my family through hell that entire year, particularly my younger brother, who told me point blank that he couldn't live with me. I had a finite time to get a job and move out. I had spent the previous four years playing bass and vocals in his pretty successful band up until that point, and although I'd finally gotten my shit together, I'd ultimately proven to be a completely untrustworthy individual. 
I quickly got a job at a local electronics manufacturer and re-enrolled in college as I had been studying electrical engineering and was close to having my associates. Hell, I even had a small business building guitar pedals at one point. Despite this, my amateur brain at the time simply could not cope with the thought of how badly I would fucked up. And instead of powering through this like an adult or getting put on some kind of SSRI, which in hindsight I needed badly, I remembered that there was one opiate supposedly far better and far more euphoric than Kratom, Tyaneptine. I had never tried it myself. In fact, my only experience with it was watching a mutual friend battle with it years prior. As fucked up as it is, what made me actually want to seek out this stuff was diving into r slash quitting Tyaneptine and reading a plethora of horror stories how hard it was to quit. The reason being was that I figured that this was reflective of how strong the euphoria was. This is a glimpse into how weirdly autistic and immature my brain works when put under stress. I didn't want this stuff being shipped to my house unless I absolutely had to, so I googled around to see if any sketchy shops sold it locally. To my surprise, there was a small business on Google Maps listed in Kenosha called Tyaneptine Friends, which had a website and was open 24-7 located in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just an hour or so from my house in Chicago. Curious, I called the number and a sickly high-pitched male answered in that stereotypical junkie drawl. I told him that I wanted 3 grams of sodium and 3 grams of free acid. He told me to drive to a specific speedway in a kind of seedy area of Kenosha. Despite giving him an hour heads up and telling him when I was leaving, he had me wait in that speedway parking lot for over an hour, which would become a semi-frequently recurring theme in the months to come. When he finally pulled up, I was greeted by the most smelly and disheveled man I had ever seen. I'm serious. The vast majority of homeless people I see walking around the streets of Chicago were more well-kept than he was. He was also one of the most fried pieces of literal shit I have ever met. I remember thinking that he looked a lot older than his voice would lead you to believe. He looked like a post meth Elmer Fudd. I got my shit from him, paid, and then left. Effects wise, I loved it more than heroin and every other opiate I had tried up until that point from the moment I felt it. It had a more uplifting, less downer feeling to it. I started using every day to ironically numb the constant thinking of the results of my previous shitty decisions. A couple weeks before the pandemic, I started renting out a band practice rehearsal space in the west side of Chicago with 24-7 access. When the pandemic laid everyone off, I had ample free time to get high and play my absolute nuts off for hours at a time. Though I technically shared the space with a few other bands, the pandemic canceled all shows for the foreseeable future and I was the only one using it. My existence for the better part of the next six months was as follows. Wake up. Eat Tyaneptine free acid, drive to the practice space, get more high, practice drumming for hours, occasionally record songs on guitar, and just generally bum around the space until I fell asleep there. I only really left the spot to pick up more Tyaneptine from Kenosha, go home to shower, or donate plasma for Tyaneptine money. While under the influence of other opioids, music didn't seem to interest me at all, but with Tyaneptine, I would often get lost in music that I'd long since forgotten about. If timed right, taking a quarter spoonful of free acid after scoring and blasting language by the contortionist as I hit the highway on my way home made the music like the first time I had heard it. Even though I'd long since stopped giving a shit about that specific kind of gent prog stuff since I started getting into good music and stopped being a teenager. Very early into the pandemic, one of my best friends, who was also my bandmate at the time, fucking died less than 8 hours after our last conversation. I promptly used this event to justify my stupid behavior going forward. Tyaneptine has this weird effect on me where it actually gives me energy, enough to drum along to insanely fast and complicated songs for literal hours, especially when combined with 4-fluorophenibut. Nobody in the family really suspected me of relapsing because I was very in shape from the drumming, ripped in fact. There was a period of this summer when I tried to quit by using Suboxone, only to discover that subs give me all the bad effects of opiates and strip me of all my motivation to do anything productive. Like Kratom, it left me feeling flat and unable to enjoy music. After weaning down and attempting to jump off at around 2 milligrams, I was left unable to sleep days on end unless the following criteria was met. Be drunk, fuck the hot ass 19 year old with thick hips and mommy milkers that I'd recently met, and chase it with a trazodone melatonin sandwich. No, like, I literally was unable to get more than two hours of sleep at night prior to having sex with her. After that, I got a solid seven. 
Being that I literally needed to fuck her in order to sleep, she rose to the top of my hierarchy of needs, which led me to being way clingy and scaring her off only a couple weeks into our thing. Shortly after she cut me off, I was in the parking lot of a Mexican restaurant in Round Lake when two guys started shooting at each other, with me directly in between them. After hightailing it out of there, I took this as a sign that life sucks and therefore I will get more Tyneptine. I then started using Tyneptine again. Later that month, my smelly Tyneptine friend informed me that he had 3-chlorophenibut powder on hand, which is the active ingredient in baclofen. I wasn't using the fluorophenibut more often than a couple times every few weeks at the time, but decided to give it a go one day. Thing is, he neglected to inform me that without a tolerance, 50 milligrams is enough to put you on your fucking ass, which without a very good scale, is impossible to measure. I scooped what I thought was a very small amount on a butter knife and ate it, promptly blacking out and waking up 23 hours later with puke on my floor. I estimate that I must have taken at least 200 milligrams. When I finally regained my composure, I felt as if all mental barriers that existed for my CPTSD and generalized anxiety had faded away for good. I was completely present, not dissociated and clear-headed for what felt like the first time in my life. A very specific idea for a song came into my head that I couldn't get enough of which sounded like a triumphant crescendo from hell. After getting on my phone, I received news that on the literal day and location that I went to go pick up my drugs, Kyle Rittenhouse had gunned down an associate of mine that frequented the same music scene I was involved with during the infamous Kenosha protests mere hours after I had left. Well, shit. The experience that made me quit this shit for good. It began like any other time I scored. I drove out to Kenosha and picked up approximately $75 worth of Taya free acid and eyeballed a small amount on a plastic spoon before gulping it down and getting on the highway back home. I felt completely normal until stepping out of my car, which is when it hit me. Now, before I go on to explain what happened next, I have to emphasize that I had an extremely high tolerance for this crap, and anyone who has taken too much Tyneptine will tell you that it has sort of a ceiling effect similar to Kratom, and that you just feel woozy and maybe throw up worst case scenario. This is not what happened. Upon stepping out of my car, I became extremely disoriented and found it very difficult to stand up. It felt like my driveway was slanted. It's very hard to explain exactly what this sensation was like, but I pretty much knew right then and there that I was fucked. I felt a pervasive sensation of needing to yawn, but it was to the point of being painful. I went inside and tried to convince myself that this was simply just a panic attack. Pacing around the room, attempting to meditate, all the while I was getting more and more dissociated by the minute. I did some push-ups and smoked a cigarette, which is when I realized that my heart rate was extremely high. I called my dealer, asked him what the fuck was up, and if he cleaned the scale used to weigh my shit. I asked him if I should go to the hospital, to which he replied, they wouldn't know how to deal with what you're going through. He actually suggested to come over to his house and let his equally fried dumbass of a wife monitor my heart while I slept. I tried explaining that I couldn't see straight at all and I was losing my basic motor skills more and more by the minute. Like, even if I was dumb enough to trust his RC fried ass self with my life, there wasn't any way that I had the coordination to drive all the way back to Kenosha with my progressively deteriorating state. Possibly foreseeing what would happen next, I opted not to sleep in my room and decided to try and wait this out on the couch in the living room, just in case this became an emergency situation. Surprise, surprise, it did. I don't remember any of this, but apparently, my dad found me passed out on the couch and didn't think much of it until he nudged me to wake me. I promptly stood up, passed out, and hit my head on the floor. Cue the next thing that I actually remember. On the couch, I was surrounded by paramedics and unable to control my limbs. I was frantically flailing my arms and unable to stay still despite the paramedics asking me to. I felt trapped in my own body. What did you take? One paramedic asked several times. All that could come out of my mouth was a multi-pitched, what? I said this multiple times, all while flailing about and scaring the ever-living shit out of my family. My dad truly thought that this was the time that I, his first son, was going to die, or worse, permanently fuck my life up into becoming handicapped via severe brain damage. According to the hospital records I requested, this is when they sedated me with ketamine to calm me the fuck down. 
This caused me to have a very vivid dream that seemed to last around two weeks involving me, one of the nurses, and driving around Bensonville in my van. In all reality, I was only out for about a day and a half. My coma dream was then interrupted by me waking up and projectile vomiting on the floor next to my hospital bed. I was in full-blown tyneptine withdrawal and in the ICU. The nurses started asking me questions, and my answers to a lot of the basic ones like the date, my name, and the president, I either got wrong or took me too far long to figure out the answers to. For some reason, I refused to tell them about the tie and eptine that I took, despite being pressed about what drugs I had taken, out of fear of retaliation from my father. In hindsight, these fears were completely unfounded for a multitude of reasons, but I was still fucking delirious from whatever the fuck I took. I couldn't remember my father's phone number, despite knowing it by heart since I was 10 years old, and I was hallucinating very strange things which were compounded by the fact that I didn't have my glasses in there. Shortly after vomiting, I began having the absolute worst pain in my lower back to the point where I was screaming my fucking head off. The nurses told me to pipe down, but I physically could not. Now, I spiral fractured my tibia and fibula at 14 when skateboarding which hurt like a bitch but the pain I was currently feeling in my back was somehow a thousand times worse. I've never had a history of self-harm, but I began violently biting and scratching my arms and hands to the point of drawing blood just to get my mind off of this pain, all while screaming bloody murder. This went on long enough for them to actually restrain my arms to the bedpost. I then started screaming stuff like, Give me opiates, please! Fuck! Fuck! Die! Please give me some fucking morphine! But a lot of it! I have a high opiate tolerance! Fuck! They eventually relented and gave me two 10 mg hydrocodone, which I promptly chewed up and tossed back. After that, the pain still wouldn't go away. I continued screaming until they gave me Haldol, which knocked me the fuck out finally, but not before forcing all the piss out of my body and all over myself, because I couldn't piss into the bedside cup thingy when prompted for some reason. The next day, I was approached by a hospital psychiatrist who asked me the questions you'd expect, had I tried to kill myself, did I have any active thoughts of hurting myself or others, etc. When she asked me if I experienced hallucinations, I distinctly remember seeing the blurry outline of what looked like a man on a horse right around my hospital room, hop onto the psychiatrist's clipboard, then under my bed. No, I replied, though this wouldn't be the last time they would come around and ask me questions along those lines, which I will get to later. I spent a total of six days in the ICU, and my memory is a bit fuzzy as to the order of the following events I'm about to describe, but I'll do my best to do so chronologically. My blood pressure was extremely elevated, and at one point, I asked if I could walk myself to the bathroom. My cardiovascular system was so fucked that I almost passed out after trying to stand up just for a few seconds while the machines monitoring my blood pressure went haywire. I opted to lay down and piss in the cup for the time being. You know, you almost died, is what one of my bedside nurses told me. At one point during the night, a patient in the room next to me needed resuscitation. A hospital worker then grabbed the biggest defib paddles I have ever seen and attempted to revive the person. He then walked out of the room looking down at the floor, clapped the paddles together which created a shower of sparks, and walked off. Thinking that it may have been a vivid dream, I asked a doctor the following morning about it, and as it turns out, that really did happen. The dude died. Another fucked up thing I saw that I'm not entirely sure if it happened was seeing a guy with a full leg cast get the end of his foot stuck in one of the hospital doors that had started to lift him upwards and off his mobile stretcher. The whole staff was trying to free him as he was screaming. As this was happening, the TV in my room was playing a live feed of an x-ray view of the guy's leg as this was going on. After they finally managed to free him from the door, by essentially forcing his leg to do the front splits, he started screaming and writhing in pain as a live feed of the internal parts of his leg showed a replay of something snapping in there. He started screaming and writhing in pain as the live feed of the internal parts of his leg showed a replay of something snapping in there, just over and over like a sports recap, an x-ray view of this guy's leg snapping. I remember this way too vividly, dream or not. I was experiencing the worst mental agony and physical pain of my life while in there, albeit not nearly as bad as when I first woke up. I was able to get fed a couple more round of Norcos to subside my withdrawals after I finally told them what I took. I was also told that my blood was sent off to poison control. A funny thing about opiate withdrawal that nobody seems to talk about is just how horny you get. 
This is due to the fact that while in active addiction, opiates actually tank your testosterone and make you not want to jerk off or even seek out sex. So when you quit, the opposite happens. Three or so days into my stay, I couldn't handle it. Being in the ICU, you have a nurse in your room 24-7 and I didn't want to be a complete degenerate by blatantly jerking off in front of them. That being said, they were on their phones or work computers 99% of the time and not actively looking at me. And with my newfound sensitivity in the crotch area, I was able to adjust my blankets in such a way where you couldn't tell that I was moving at all and come into prepared tissues in 20 seconds or less stealthily as fuck. I probably jerked off a minimum of 10 times a day for the remainder of my ICU carrier and never got caught or make a sound even. One of my greatest achievements in life, probably above my engineering degree. Are you proud of me, dad? Another side effect of opiate withdrawal is the return of creativity. I was coming up with mad song ideas, lyrics even. I wanted nothing more than to come home and play more stupid goofy avant-garde on my H-string. I realized on that hospital bed that while in active addiction, I was simply going through the motions when it came to music. I wasn't playing to play, hell, I barely recorded. I was just getting high and seeing how long I could maintain a 260 beats per minute blast beat while modifying pedals to make the kick drum mic in the practice space go through a compressor like a crackhead. I had several deep conversations with the various nurses in charge of keeping an eye on me which made me realize how grateful I should be to be alive. One of them described how they survived a famine in Poland during the collapse of the USSR and upon landing in the United States, she actually teared up at the sight of all the food inside of the first grocery store she went inside of. Another was from Northern Africa, where a civil war was currently taking place and the rest of her family was in constant danger. A third told me how an adverse reaction to a flu shot landed him in the ICU for a whole 8 months and how he basically finessed his way out of having to pay a dime out of the 7 figure hospital bill without it affecting his credit. At some point, I was approached by another hospital psychiatrist who asked me the same round of questions and being that I was at the lowest point of my life and finally able to cry due to not being numbed out, I started to sob like a little baby and told him about how much I wanted to kill myself and that I was sexually assaulted when I was 6. Because of this, I was discharged to the psych unit for a mandatory 72 hour hold after I was finally able to walk and my blood pressure returned back to normal. In the psych ward, I met a bunch of cool people who I still talk to, a fat dickhead who I ended up triggering, and most dishearteningly, a childhood friend of mine. This friend of mine had previously been missing for over two years out of state after having a mental break. This friend, who I reconnected with in our later teens, was always doing and selling hella drugs. Sometime after we reconnected when we were both 21, he apparently became a completely different person. After going MIA in California circa 2017, he had apparently become a meth-addicted vagrant on top of showing signs of severe schizophrenia. The person that stood before me in the psych ward in September of 2020 was not the same person I grew up with skateboarding when we were 12. Hell, it wasn't even the same person I did acid with in 2014. What stood before me was a wide-eyed, Sid Barrett of a man who would talk to himself when alone in his room and laugh like a maniac. During lunch, he would chew his food with his mouth open and sometimes not even use utensils like a fucking animal. This deeply disturbed me. At one point during group therapy, the therapist had a prompt and all of us would then answer it one by one. The prompt, if you had a magic wand it could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Standard group innocuous therapy stuff, right? Wrong. When I got to this girl who I started befriending in there, she said that she wished that politicians would actually get stuff done. I piped up and said that the reason they don't currently work is because they're all pedophilic boomers who deleted all semblance of neuroplasticity by doing too much coke in the 80s. This made everyone laugh including the therapist, all except for this one fat kid. He started going off on this gigantic tirade that went along the lines of, I don't think that's funny man, you're saying that these politicians who swore on the bible are doing drugs? I'm in a secretive youth group for future leaders, we've met all the politicians, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. He started punching walls and walking towards me. What was I thinking as this was happening? I was laughing my ass off, but a tad bit worried that if he swung at me, my PTSD and years of jujitsu would kick in and then I would have to deal with a fat kid with a broken arm and potentially more time in that hellhole. Before he could swing at me, the therapist pushed the panic button and he was promptly scooped up by security and a doctor. They booty juiced him and the next time I saw him a few hours later, he was in a held all days as he packed his stuff to be transferred to a higher security psych ward. Fucking idiot. Anyways, after my 72 hours was up, I was promptly set free and never touched that shit again because opiates are for pussies. 
Later in life, I ended up getting addicted to phenobut and amphetamines like a real man, but that story is for a different day. This experience traumatized me very deeply. For the next year or so, I began to have this reoccurring delusion where I was absolutely convinced in the back of my mind that I was still in that coma in real life due to how vivid the initial coma dream lasted. I ended up writing a song about this experience as well. For those interested, I'll put the link in the description. As of writing this, I finally kicked all substances and am 47 days sober after finding psych meds that helped me address my CPTSD and depression without resorting to terrible decisions that inevitably lead me to ruining my life and almost dying. I have also received a formal diagnosis for autism spectrum disorder, which in hindsight was very fucking obvious to everyone but me. Let me start this report by saying that you should never, under any circumstances, take 28 milligrams or anything close to 28 milligrams of 25i NBOME. Fatal overdoses have been reported with several times less, and although other drugs or allergic reactions may or may not have been involved in those cases, 25i NBOME is a potentially dangerous drug if used in excess. 28 milligrams is excess. Very little is known about this drug, and while I am able to enjoy it today in safe doses, it should not be taken lightly. This trip was not intentional. A few years back, I had a bit of an opiate habit that had been eating away at my wallet. My drug of choice was hydromorphone, and my preferred ROA was IV. Hydromorphone is hard to come by in my area, and prices are quite high for it, so I started experimenting with other opiates whenever they were cheaper. I had experimented with hydrocodone, diamorphine, tramadol, fentanyl, and codeine briefly, and my dealer told me one day that he had some Oxycontin. Having never tried this, I purchased just under 30 milligrams from him. He told me the pills had gotten crushed and had lost a little weight, which was no problem to me since he offered it to me at a very cheap price. The powder, which was very fine, was 28 milligrams. It seemed odd that the pill had been uniformly crushed into a fine powder, but I didn't think too much of it. At the time, I had just run out of needles and I wasn't going to get any more until my next package came in the mail, so I asked about snorting it. The dealer said it would work fine, so I went home and prepared two small lines, one for each nostril. Snorting the first line felt like I had been kicked by a mule in the brain, but being convinced that I had been in an opiate-induced state of euphoria and warmth in just a few moments, I snorted the other line, experiencing the same level of agony as the first. Within two minutes, I started to notice euphoria, a rush of energy, and mild hallucinations, similar to taking a few tabs of LSD. My vision began to pulse in a strobe-like fashion, shifting and floating around. I could feel the energy of every object around me, and I knew the location of everything in the room without even looking around. The doorknob particularly fascinated me. It had turned into a spring-like shape and expanded and contracted across the room, creating a heavily ringing sound as it did so. My hookah, which was not packed or lit at the time, appeared to have smoke pouring out of the hose. The smoke approached my face slowly, and once it hit me, it exploded into light. I believe this was due to the hookah sitting under the light in my apartment. The smoke may have been a warped hallucination of the light, but I am not sure. These hallucinations all greatly excited me as a fairly inexperienced drug user. I had no idea that an opiate could make you trip. After another two minutes, I realized that what I had taken was not an opiate. My heart was pounding and I was starting to sweat. My body started to jerk slightly at various points every few seconds. Worried that I was having a bad trip, my first priority was to take a Xanax or two and then make it to my bed to lay down. Neither of these goals were accomplished. Upon standing up from the couch where I had snorted the Oxycontin, I became dizzy and closed my eyes for a second. This is where the trip got really crazy. I have never in my entire life experienced closed eye visuals as intense as that moment. Fractal patterns easily surpassing the ones from DMT flew past the inside of my eyelids. As the visuals moved towards and over me, I could feel wind blowing over my entire body. The wind turned into vibrations, which turned into music. I'd experienced auditory hallucinations on 25 hits of LSD IV'd before. I do not recommend this unless you are positive that you are physically and mentally ready for it but I had only noticed fleeting ambient sounds. These, however, were full-blown songs. Multiple instruments playing, lyrics being sung by sirens and languages from other dimensions, polyrhythms, choruses, verses, everything. 
It was incredible. I saw colors that do not exist outline my own mind and thoughts in the form of molecular structures and hieroglyphics. I lost all sense of smell and emotion, and I remained still for what felt literally like years. I stood there and existed. I was no longer human. I was time and energy. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor, rolling around and moving uncontrollably. At first I thought I was laughing, but I quickly realized that I was in a seizure. Brief terror set in as I realized that I was going to die. I tried to close my eyes, deciding to try to enjoy my final moments as best as possible. I couldn't feel my body and I couldn't tell if I was breathing or not. I began to think of all the mistakes I had made in my life, but I somehow was able to remind myself that thinking about negative things is an easy way to trigger a bad trip. Aside from the seizure and potential death, the trip was quite enjoyable, even mid-seizure. And I guess somehow, subconsciously, my brain decided that if I was going to die, I'd at least die having somewhat of a good time. I think about this part of the trip the most, as it sticks out to me more than anything else. I had accepted that I was about to die, or at least I thought, as I wasn't entirely sure what drug I had taken, and I still was able to stay calm and focus on positive things. I always assumed that overdosing on a psychedelic would be a surefire way to experience a bad trip, but the euphoria I was experiencing even in that moment overwhelmed any brief spurts of fear or anxiety. I thought about my childhood friend, who will be referred to with a fake name as Mila to maintain anonymity, who I had always been close to and hoped that she would handle the news of my death well. Two weeks later, although it felt like no time had passed at all, I awoke in the hospital in the ICU. I remember seeing Mila and I remember asking her how she had died as well. I did not realize I was in the hospital and thought we had both ended up in some sort of spiritual limbo. I do not remember what she said to me. I, according to Mila, fell asleep mid-sentence. Mila and my nurses stated that I awoke three more times, none of which I remember, and said that I had woken up for a few seconds before the first time I remember waking up as well. The next memory I have was of my catheter being taken out. I did not feel it at all, which seemed strange, until the nurse explained that I was heavily sedated. She explained that I had been placed in a medically induced coma. This sounded good to me, and I went back to sleep without asking any questions. My memory is fairly foggy after that, which seems odd since my next memories came a fair bit after coming out of a coma, but my first few memories were closer to the coma and seemed clearer. Over the course of a few days, it was explained to me that Mila had come over to my house to see if I was home and heard signs of a struggle inside. Mila has a key to my house, and when she came in, she immediately called an ambulance and provided CPR and rescue breathing while stabilizing my head until the paramedics arrived. I was almost immediately placed into a coma so my body could stabilize, and at one point, I was not expected to come out of it. Thankfully, I recovered almost fully. I have a small twitch in my neck, I heavily damaged my sense of smell, which is not expected to ever recover, and I suffered a concussion when I fell over. I went into cardiac arrest, suffered minor brain damage, and suffered from short-term memory loss for several months while I recovered both in and eventually outside of the hospital. I experienced very minor but consistent symptoms of HPPD to this day, well over a year later. My doctors are unsure if it will go away within the foreseeable future, but I do not mind it. After hearing that I had been hospitalized, the dealer contacted Mila and told her what substance I had taken. This information helped the doctors and could have saved my life. Sometime after hearing that I had been placed in a coma, the dealer who sold me the 25i NBOME as Oxycontin turned himself into the police. He is on parole now and has stopped both dealing and using drugs. He offered to pay all of my medical bills, won't let me pay for dinner, and despite who he used to be, he is now the most selfless, kind, and thoughtful human being that I have ever known. I have accepted his apologies, I hold no grudges against him, and we are close friends. He has asked me to be the best man at his wedding this winter. He has never forgiven himself for his actions, and he admitted that he did it just to offload the 25i MBOME since he had nobody interested in buying it. I hope that one day he will be ready to forgive himself, and I will be there for him when he does. For anybody out there thinking of selling research chemicals or any substance as another drug, think twice. It may haunt you for the rest of your life, even after others have forgiven you. I have done 25i NBOME in normal to highish doses since then, from 500 micrograms to 6 milligrams after waiting a year to try it again. I have had nothing but wonderful experiences, and it is in my top 3 favorite drugs. I now prefer it even over LSD due to the energy boost it gives me. 
On an interesting side note, I had no interest in opiates after this trip. I tried to stop using them before the trip with brief success, but relapse always occurred. I've tried them a few times, but they just aren't enjoyable to me. I definitely feel the effects, but the effects from opiates are no longer what I prefer. I enjoy psychedelics on a casual basis, but not much else. Not even cannabis, really. I do not recommend taking this substance in any level purely to quit another substance. Therapy, rehabilitation, and medical assistance from licensed physicians is the only method I recommend for quitting any drug. Be safe and have fun out there. It is absolutely true that you can't feasibly lethally overdose on cannabis normally, but what I did was not normal, nor was it safe, and it almost led to my death. I deal with multiple mental health issues. I'm diagnosed with depression and OCD, but I have other things going on as well. Because of that, I've been on 40 milligrams of Prozac daily since May. I've been dabbling and getting high since January. My grandfather's a stoner and we have good times together, smoking and talking under the stars or at the beach or just chilling in his van. So when I started taking these pills, I checked for interactions on Google. It said that cannabis shouldn't be used with Prozac as it can cause serotonin syndrome, which is potentially lethal. I was quite disappointed, but I did further research on it online and saw that many people use weed on Prozac with no issues. So I thought, well, the risk is probably low I thought that with the amount of people that have used and abused drugs on Prozac and have used weed in tandem with medication to help with their mental health issues, this serotonin syndrome shit is probably a WebMD-esque scare. It didn't help that I'd seen it mentioned before with other drug interactions that turned out fine, but yeah, I just ignored it. Big mistake. I started using regularly once I bought a bit of weed off of someone and had some gifts from my grandfather stocked up. Just to quell some of the comments I know are coming. This shit was all entirely legit. I know for a fact. The people I bought from were highly trusted, and I used stuff from the same bags as my grandfather and friends, who never told me they felt anything strange from it. I decided I was just going to get high often for a while, as at that point in my life, I had nothing else to do. Unemployed, mentally ill, and not allowed in my house for most of the day every day. This was around late July. I'm not an optimistic guy, but even I can admit I'm in a better place now. Anyway, I started using, and straight away, things felt different. A lot more intense. I thought it was just the strain that I found some really good shit. But yeah, when I smoked, I just get so fucking high. I get all shaky and lose a lot of physical awareness and just float and spin around the room and forget what I was saying and have a hell of a time. The euphoria was crazy. I loved it. I was fucking hooked, but looking back, it wasn't what I thought it was. It started with the shakes. Once I had started using a bit, they just never went away. I was a bit worried, so I looked it up, and according to the internet, getting weed shakes was normal when high, so I just thought I was a bit odd and I would get them after I came down. I'd never gotten them before, but my use before was always few and far between, with relatively mild strains. So that's what I thought it was. Even as they got so bad, I could barely roll a joint. Those fuckers I did manage to roll look goddamn ugly too. As the next week or two rolled around and they got worse, I just ignored them. Accepted that they would be a part of my life now. As well as that, I started craving weed more and more. I had never felt like that using before. It was like the cravings I got when I would get myself into a bad rut with alcohol, but worse. I ignored that too. I'm such a fucking dumbass, honestly. But I wouldn't learn that till one particular night. It was a Friday. I sat and smoked in the forest that morning and got entirely fucked. I just lay down and listened to my favorite album at the time. The experience was magical. Beyond anything I had felt before, I wanted more. So that night, I decided to smoke again, twice in one day. Something I hadn't done before, but I figured it was going to start happening soon enough. I waited for it to get dark, then went out on my balcony and lit up. I wanted to get the smoking done quickly, so I was taking a hit every second breath or so, which was another fucking dumb mistake, but I didn't really know at the time, so I didn't really blame myself either. About halfway through the joint, it hit me. Hit me like a fucking freight train. I was excited and happy, so I kept smoking with vigor. But as it got more intense, I decided to put out the joint and put it back in my pocket for later. 
that decision likely saved my life. About 20 seconds later, I realized I needed to sit down, so I stumbled onto my knees on the deck. There was an intense pressure in my head and this high-pitched ringing sound, something I'd experienced before whilst high, but this was on another level. I wasn't scared because weed is a relatively safe drug under normal circumstances, so I just rode the wave and ended up passing out. I heard my deodorant can that I had brought with me fall out of my hands and onto the deck as I left my body, and the world went black and indescribable. The noise of the can rang in my head and I heard whispers and had strange fragments of dream and hallucination play in my consciousness. But as soon as I could think even somewhat coherently, I started to try to regain that consciousness and my composure because I realized the noise must have awoken the other people in my house and I couldn't let them see me like this. I desperately tried to get up and get to the door. The whole world was strange. I couldn't see properly and I kept blacking out as I went and falling back into the weird dream hallucination state, but I managed to navigate back to my room. After a strained talk with my family members, I was now free to enjoy my high. I lay in my bed twitching and shaking and laughed to myself about the craziness that just occurred. It seemed fun to me now, like some kind of fucked up adventure. Things got even crazier from there. I started feeling intense euphoria and got super hyperactive. The room distorted to look much longer than it was, as if it was stretched out. I felt like I was slightly removed from my body too, but the craziest thing was my phone. As I held it in my hand, it started looking really strange, as if it was some kind of stream of information, it's hard to explain. It looked kind of fake as well, and I could feel everything I did on it and felt connected to all of it. I could see it normally, but I would see it in this weird way at the same time, like a metaphor coming to life. It was a hallucination that would come in waves of intensity, and my mind would often devolve into more weird fragmented hallucinatory trains of thought as well. It was wild and kind of amazing, and I was grinning ear to ear and enjoying it. I started spamming my boyfriend and convinced him to call me so I could tell him how amazing everything was and what just happened to me even though he was right in the middle of doing things. After that, I just continued to enjoy everything, until I didn't. After a while, I don't know why, but things just started to feel off. The euphoria was gone and so were the hallucinations but the shaking and twitching was getting more intense and my muscles were tensing up against my will really badly. This had happened before when I got high that first time. My muscles would all slowly tense up more and more until my back was arched and my whole body was entirely stiff. At the time, I just thought it was me reacting to the feeling of floating, but now, I didn't feel that way. And it was still happening, worse and worse, faster and faster. My shakes were so bad I was making the bed shake. I was sweating, my heart was beating incredibly fast, and the pressure in my head felt insane and incapacitating. That was when I remembered serotonin syndrome. I thought, surely not. I'm just really high and paranoid like those people who go to the hospital convinced that they're dying. But I checked the symptoms, and they all fit. Agitation, crazy fast heart rate, dilated pupils, loss of muscle coordination and twitching, muscle rigidity, sweating, shivering high temperature, tremors, irregular heartbeat, even loss of consciousness. My heart slowly sank as I read that from there. It was seizures, coma, and death. Fear engulfed me. At that moment, as my entire body was racked with twitching and shaking and tensing, I knew I was going to die. I was stupid and I fucked up, and this, this was how it was all going to end. I started crying. I couldn't believe I could be this fucking stupid, and I was about to pay the ultimate price. I desperately tried to contact my boyfriend, but he was out driving, so I left him a message and just accepted it. I didn't want to call an ambulance because I was ashamed and afraid of the consequences. I am suicidal, so I don't mind dying too much, although I hadn't done everything I wanted to do at that point, so it did upset me too. I wanted my boyfriend with me, and I wanted it to be peaceful when I wanted it. Not like this, but this was what was happening, so I put on some comforting music and relented to it, let the spasming and all continue. Except, my boyfriend came home and freaked out and called me. The terror and pain in his voice still haunts me to this day. He stayed on call with me for the next few hours as things got progressively worse. I struggled to hold on to consciousness. The feeling in my head got to levels of intensity that I didn't even know it could reach. 
My entire body kept shaking and seizing up more, less controllably than before, faster than before. My heart beat so fast I thought it was going to burst right out of my chest. I was sweating profusely and I was burning hot to the touch. I tried to stay awake and talking, but according to my boyfriend, there was a few times in which I stopped talking and started letting out these strange moaning and choking noises, shaking so crazily he could hear through the speaker of my headset. I'm not sure if I had any seizures at that time or not. I got so worn out and tired that I stopped fighting against it, once again waiting for my death. But slowly, as I wrote it out, I started to improve. I started noticing that the tensing of my muscles happened at a lower frequency and I could stop it as it was happening more. The shaking lessened and the feeling in my head started to clear. I realized that I was out of the woods and I was honestly the most happy to be alive that I have been in many years. I may want to die, but I did not want to die that night. Not like that. And I didn't. Eventually I managed to get some sleep and I woke up the next day almost fully recovered. I was still shaky and extremely tired out and my heart felt kind of fucked up, but I was fine. At least physically I was. I can't describe to you how scarred and traumatized I felt that next day. I went to the beach and just quietly relished in the beauty of nature, knowing full well that I may have not seen it at all. I felt like everything was strange and I was removed from the world. I felt I shouldn't have survived, but I did. And now months later, I haven't touched weed at all. It was hard for the first week, like really hard. I hadn't used for that long, but the withdrawals were honestly insane. I put it down to the fucking up of my serotonin, but I wanted it so bad. I wanted it all, even with the brush with death attached. I didn't care. It took all of the self-control I had to give all my stuff away, but I'm glad I did. Because a few weeks later I got a job offer, at a job that required drug testing prior to being hired. I have that job now, and I'm really fucking grateful because it's amazing. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that awful experience making me lay off the weed. And I'm going to continue to until I'm no longer on any SSRIs or medications that affect my serotonin. And I advise that you do too, because although it doesn't seem to happen to everyone, I still would not want anyone to go through the utter hell that I did. Feel free to call me a dumbass, because I was. I'll never make the mistakes that I did again, and I want to get this message out there because I don't want anyone else to make them either. Plus four is a rating for a psychedelic experience which is profound, life-changing, and one that is very rarely attained, but is often sought after. Some people choose to do drugs to alter their state of mind, others to escape reality, but the historically accepted reason was to always touch a divine level or plane of existence, one where a person sees clearly what the future has in store for them. But the deepest, supreme purpose for this altered state was to gain a better understanding of the universe and our place in the grand scheme. I named this experience 4 Plus because I don't believe Plus 4 does my experience justice. I went through a period in my life when I felt my soul deteriorating my very will to live slipping away. This wasn't a matter of depression. Indeed, I haven't had a depressed day in my life. Nor does it infer that I wanted my life to end. I felt as if I neither understood myself nor the world around me in the least. I received a package of salvia in the mail. In it was one ounce of salvia leaves, crushed, one gram of five times extract and one gram of 15 times extract. I read up on salvia thoroughly, as I always do to prepare me for a new drug, having experienced a plethora of herbal and synthetic inebriants in the past. And when I thought I was well prepared, I took a deep breath and continued with my first experience. It was late, about 11.30, and I just got in from a party. A lame one, no alcohol or drugs, but that wasn't the reason it was lame. I was stone cold sober, with nothing in my system but a couple slices of cheese pizza. I packed my bong, water removed, since I wasn't sure if salvinorin was water soluble. With a couple of leaves, and with my torch, I lit the bowl and took a huge hit, killed the bowl. I had read that the breakthrough may or may not take multiple hits, but to be ready and be near a bed. So, I held the hit and walked over to my bed before exhaling the smoke. The hit was a little harsh, but nothing for an avid pot smoker. It had a distinct flavor, a little nasty, but not terrible. 
I lay on my bed with the TV on for a few minutes, but realized the hit was taking way too long to take effect, so I walked back into the kitchen to prepare another bowl. Okay, time for hit, the second. This time, I packed the bowl with a leaf of salvia and maybe five milligrams, 10 or so little flakes of the 15 times extract. I killed the bowl again with one huge toke. At this point, I thought I was convinced this legal high thing was pure bunk. This time, it was a little more harsh and I had to exhale before leaving the kitchen. I immediately started walking toward the bedroom. That is all I remember until I came partially to. I awoke in my closet, hysterically tossing clothing and other junk all over the place, but I didn't know it was clothing. I was immersed in a world in which I was a character in a show, not a sitcom or anything, but the me show. My whole life had been staged, almost like the Truman Show, and I had finally awoken from this fantasy world and realized that this was so. I was on a stage and I heard applause from everywhere. People all around me were so happy that I finally figured it out. At this point, I saw a clown, a person that was there to guide me, show me the real world and try to calm me down. I also heard a song playing over and over again, almost like a broken record. It was the repetitive song that clued me into this fake world. And when the clown sighed and realized that I knew what was going on, he showed me into this door, the door to the real world. And I walked onto a set, a children's show, which explained the clown. And I walked down a series of steps, in reality, video cassettes that I knocked over at some point, until I came to and was back in reality within seconds. I went from being 100% in the strange world created by my mind under the influence, to the real world in less than 10 seconds or so. I must add that a result of this salvia trip, although I don't think trip applies, I ended up with multiple injuries including cuts, scrapes, black and blues, and a minor concussion. I assume after seeing the horrible state of my apartment that I was quite irate about something. I also remembered next to nothing within minutes. The entire experience lost. When I checked the clock as I came back to the real world, more than three hours passed. I realized I took way too much as a result of my skepticism after my first toke. I decided to repeat the experience a second time, but this time with a trip sitter. I was in a familiar setting with a good friend, one who I trusted with my life. And after explaining my previous experience, he decided not to try the substance, but agreed to sit for me. This time I used the five times extract with some dried leaves, a half a leaf and five milligrams of the five times extract. I took a toke and as the first time, I was engulfed in the experience the same way. And while I failed to remember the first experience just after it occurred, I now remember all of it. Although I lost touch with reality within moments, here's what happened. Moments after the toke, about 15 seconds, while telling my friend what was going on, at that point nothing, I felt a tingling in the back of my head. It reminded me of my previous experience somehow, and I became terrified immediately. Being experienced with psychedelics, I knew I had to calm myself and be reminded that whatever happens, it will be temporary and worthwhile. But before I could calm myself, I saw the fabric of reality unzip before my very eyes. Keep in mind that while others have since described this unzipping of reality, I used this term before I had ever read it. As I saw this zipper unzip the fabric of reality, the new reality looked identical in every aspect. I can only muster a few words to warn and prepare my trip sitter for what was to come. Oh no, it's happening again. I stood up violently and ran down to the basement where there was less to break and less space to run around in. All the while, everything I saw and touched worked itself into my hallucination. If that's what it was, stay tuned for my own analysis. My friend replaced the clown in my previous trip, trying to calm me down and integrate me into this new world. In this experience, again, the world wasn't real. It was a stage and my friend was just a player, actor who when he realized that I finally figured it all out, was supposed to guide me and wait for whoever to come and get me. It took about five minutes for me to come back to reality, fully. But my friend made me sit there and tell him of my memories of that experience. I remembered much more this time. I remembered the fabric unzipping and being pulled around me, running downstairs, and finally how he consoled me and snapped me out of it. But then he brought me back upstairs to the mess of a house I left his with. 
I was delirious for about 15 minutes and in an irate way ranted and raved, banged on walls, almost broke a window, and at one point pulled out a large kitchen knife and held it to my wrist, threatening to commit suicide. While this is getting long, this had a profound experience on my life, and I hope you have gotten this far. If so, here comes the moral of the story. My immediate understanding of the experience, the personally important part, is that my delusion was one of my life not being real, but one constructed around me, like the Truman Show. Since then, I have developed the ability to read people, understand their states of mind, and overall, am able to empathize and help people deal with their problems. This goes much deeper and farther. I also think I have an understanding of this drug's mode of action. I believe salvia awakens the normally dormant sleep centers of the brain, mostly the subconscious, while the conscious parts are also active, hearing, sight, taste, touch, and smell. The two seem to merge and the brain tries to make sense of it all. And just as dreams seem real while I'm dreaming, this combination experience, dream and wake, is made to seem real. I am actually integrating a dream with waking interactions. Thus, if I walk into a wall, even if a wall isn't present in my dream, it spontaneously exists since I bumped into one. And as I increase the dosage of the active principles, Salvinor and A and B, the more my dream seems to take hold. I remember grabbing a banister for stairs while under the influence, and it completely broke off the wall. In reality, I grabbed a doorknob and missed. But since in my dream I grabbed it, and in reality missed, the banister seemed to break off, which added to the illusion of reality being fake, making it seem like a set. The banister seemed to break off, which added to the illusion of reality being fake, making it seem like a set. Words don't even come close to portraying the profound impact of these experiences. But I do believe that in a dark, silent room, I would have a normal salvia experience, which, in my opinion, is just an impromptu dream. I am finished with my story, but it doesn't even come close to describing how profound an experience the trips were. Suffice to say that both were over and above plus four experiences. I am much too afraid to try it a third time, but maybe someday I'll muster the courage. Okay, that's it. My most profound experience to date. Almost. I believe that it is this expansion that allows dormant parts of the brain to be accessed and allows impulses to travel to nearby parts of the brain, allowing for cross connections to expand our mind. I know that with all experiences I've had, I can't say anything more than, oh, that was fun, eye-opening, intense, or interesting, except this one. Now, I am not one who believes in the paranormal, yet since my experience I am able to read people better, see what's in their mind, almost read their thoughts, and as a result, I am able to say exactly what they need to hear to feel better. I am not a mind reader, I am able to empathize completely. I am able to instantly put myself into their shoes and feel the emotions they feel by living their experiences for an instant. Just like people are deficient in clotting factors or stomach acid, some people's minds are deficient in or handle incorrectly certain neurochemicals. Over time, changes in perception, understanding, or thought process may become affected. I know my use of psychedelics and the like enabled me to change my perception for a short while, and it is these changes that make me grow as a person. I do not use one chemical too often, perhaps one to three times each, except good old MJ just enough to make sure I have one meaningful experience, one from which I can say I gained a greater understanding of my own mind. As anyone who knows of this drug, the realms this plant may show you are difficult to put into words, as though describing another sense. It was a July evening, calming nature surrounded me, and the glistening orange beam of sunlight fell into the green canopy, emitting a spiritual aura that was to commence me on my journey. For the last few weeks leading up to this, I had wanted to get my curious hands on Jimson seeds. I had been doing a year abroad in Berkeley, so psychonauts were common. After reading about this mysterious plant, I was more than just intrigued. Having previously had a passion for salvia and other natural delirients, Datura seemed to be the missing link. I had never fully broken through, but psychedelics had become an almost cult-like obsession of mine. You see, I wasn't interested in the highs, the buzzes, or the euphoria of most substances. What got me was what they don't speak about, 
the spiritual groundbreaking reality some hidden plants could take you to. This made everything else irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. This Valhalla was one I could really see without having to imagine. So, after reading about this substance, my intrigue was too powerful. I felt as though I was chosen, as though this was now my turn to peek behind the curtain. Eventually, after countless dark web searches, my efforts came to no avail. In fact, this only made me more desperate to find it. Of all the psychonauts I knew, only one could help me in my search. This guy was called Jack. He was to become the one person I could take this with. After a few days of waiting, I was awoken from my sleep to see that I had managed to find some seeds. I froze. Reality hit me. This was real. My brain was anxious, but my desires prevailed. The mix of adrenaline and excitement led to loss of sleep that night. After having prepared the day for this trip, we drove to the forest in silence. We took the seeds. I felt belly aching nausea for the first five minutes. Now we wait, I thought. Jack stood watching as a trip sitter, slowly roasting a joint as I prepared myself. All anxiety had gone. In fact, I felt completely sober, clear headed, but physically slow. Suddenly, after a while, I saw my friend Jess. She'd come to see how I was doing. She'd been there before with me on shrooms, but I hadn't seen her in so long. Are you feeling it yet? Not really. I just feel dehydrated. I think they might be low dosed. However, I felt this negative feeling in my gut when I looked at her. I remembered the fakeness and wondered why she was even here. She cheated on me. She's not my friend. Jack called out. What are you doing? Come back. Why is he trying to stop me from seeing Jess? I thought. For a brief second, reality struck me. What am I doing? I looked up to see nothing but the cool air. Night was commencing. Shivers went down my spine. My anxiety grew rapidly. I knew I was delirious. Then I was back to the strange realm. We decided we needed to get back. Things were becoming more and more weird. We somehow made it to my apartment. Jack insisted on staying to look after me. Whilst the PS4 was on, I thought I'd make a drink for my guest. I saw my dad there. His face seemed much younger, but anger could be seen in his face. Don't invite people without telling me. This isn't your place. I sulked off like a child back to my room. I opened the window, pulled out a lucky strike and puffed it. It was euphoric, but just as I was beginning to have my first few inhales, I heard Jack run into my room. Close the window right now. Why? He slammed it back and a look of terror was on his face. You're not in a good way. Shut up. I invited you to my dad's apartment for the night to chill. Don't be a pain. You're fucked. This isn't your dad's place. Your dad has passed away. We need to sober you up. I'm worried. I'm fine. I didn't take any real notice of what he was saying. In fact, I barely even recognized him. Why is he in my house? I knew I was supposed to be doing something today. I had forgotten I had taken to Tura, forgotten who Jack was, and forgotten who I was. This terrified me. Paradox after paradox, I felt I was insane. I carried on smoking. My memory is still fuzzy at this part of the experience. According to Jack's recollection, I was angrily speaking gibberish. Not just a mix and match of words, but complete fluent gibberish, as if I was speaking another language. However, things got even more intense, and this is where my memory is really hazy. Jack told me that I was puffing away on an imaginary cigarette, talking to myself for an hour. Once he came into the room, however, he saw that I was in serious delirium. My arms were bleeding. I felt as though pain would take me away from this hellish reality. Pain would make me feel normal. Pain would zap me back into a microsecond of reality to have a glimpse back on normality. Just to be clear, I have never been into self-harming and before this, had been free from any mental illnesses. This was the only antidote for me to escape this hell. Only a few minor cuts were in my arm before I dropped the pocket knife in a small puddle of blood. This was not the enlightening experience I thought I may have. After Jack moved me to bed, he said I lucidly told him I was sobering up and was fine. This couldn't be further from the truth, but this truth was found only too late. The whispers pounding my mind were unbearable. I had lost my mind. After I crashed, I found myself on Jack's sofa. He found me lying unconscious on the floor of my kitchen, with butter spread all over the floor and cat food on top of the fridge. Eventually, after a few days, I was back into normal reality, yet the effects have never completely subdued. 
The existential dread of the trip was so real and so horrifying. I have been diagnosed with manic depression and general anxiety. Jack never really spoke to me in the same way, and I feel completely alone, knowing that just behind this very thin fabric of normality is hell just around the corner. Detour is the antithesis of enlightenment. It is the destroyer of hope. Drugs have been a part of me for around two years now. What I experienced two days ago inevitably changed me forever. Life is something we cannot give or take from someone. It is built into us. You cannot tear the soul from someone or steal their psyche. Every individual is a temple of our own imagination, reality, thought, consciousness, being. It would be a waste of time to babble on about my feelings about life at this point. So I'll save you the time and maybe teach you something. I have been using AMT and Foxy for a few months now. I have had around five experiences with AMT and many more with Foxy. To me, AMT was a gift. For 12 hours on any certain day, my mood would be lifted and I would appreciate everything around me. I just sit here and think about that saying, you never know what you had until you lose it. We had just started school a few weeks ago and our group of friends have already been coming to school under the influence of various drugs. My girlfriend was always against my drug habits and would always pester me about them. I guess now she just gave up or something. I loved her with all my heart and truly believed we had something special, something that would last an eternity. I never knew that my utter stupidity would destroy the one thing dearest to me in my life. My girlfriend, we'll call her Kay, started watching what I was doing. She began to get interested in drugs and how they affected me. She was always open-minded and creative. She was just so perfect. As she became more and more interested, the topic of trying drugs herself came up. Since our families, or lack of, had their differences, we would only see each other at school most of the time. Though I thought about the consequences of trying a substance at school for the first time, I remember saying to myself, bad stuff only happens to other people. I just wish I could turn back time. Meanwhile, I was selling Foxy and AMT at school to close friends and was pulling in a nice amount of cash, which however, didn't weigh out the risk, but I kept doing it. I guess I found some type of thrill or exhilaration in my endeavors, or maybe I was just stupid. We set a date for Kay's first Fox experience, and that day, me, Kay, and F, a close friend, came to school and dosed on Foxy. Me and F had 15 milligrams since we were experienced, and I gave K 12 milligrams. All in all, she loved it. It was probably one of the best things to happen to her in a long time. I guess I felt proud of myself for making her so happy, but on the other hand, her excitement worried me. Regardless, a week later we had a brilliant idea. I was going to let her try some AMT, which was sure to raise her spirits and give her what she needed. We were both very excited. The plan was to dose at 5 in the morning by giving F and K a drink to take home the night before so they could dose the next morning before school. The night before I gave them the doses, I talked to my brother, Jay, who was in a sense, the drug lord. He handled the chemicals and I sold them. I told him what I needed and I went to bed. He told me he would put it in the drinks and refrigerate them. It was no doubt he was tired after a day of work, but he assured me that I could get some sleep and he would leave them out for tomorrow. The next morning I woke up and dosed, the 40 milligrams, or so I thought, of AMT was mixed in orange juice so it wasn't that bad of a taste. An hour after I dosed I started feeling the beginning effects so I started getting ready for school. When it was time to go I walked outside the house and immediately knew something was different. As I walked in the school my movements were fluid like I was walking underwater. At that point I knew something was up. I had taken AMT before, and it was never anything like this. When I met F and K in the morning, I asked them how they were doing, and they said they were alright. I asked my girlfriend if she liked it, and unlike her response with Foxy, which was, oh my god yes, she just said, it's okay I guess, which kinda worried me, but I didn't think anything of it. Here's when I noticed something was very wrong. 
It was becoming increasingly intense around two hours into it, and I told F and K that this is normal, and Jay probably gave us a few milligrams extra. I walked with K to her classes for the first two periods. Second period, she told me something was wrong. I asked her how she was doing and if she liked it, and she said no. This got me very upset. I started really worrying, fearing she was going to have a bad trip. She lied to me, obviously, and told me she was fine and it's okay, and even told me, it's fun, after she knew I was getting real worried. After she left for her next class, I calmed down and just thought that AMT wasn't powerful enough to excite a full-blown bad trip, and I thought she would just kind of roll out of it, so I stopped worrying and destined myself to have a great time. The next period was the peak. At that point, I knew I was on something much more than just 40 milligrams. I was getting incredible close and open eye visuals and a lot of tracers, which didn't bother me. I felt that anything in the world could go wrong and I would still be as happy as I was at that point. I was having the best trip of my life. During fifth period, Kay's lunch period, I was walking down the hall to go to the bathroom and I passed the school administrator that had one of those walkie talkies on. It must have been God's will that gave me the urge to go into that hall and pass that administrator at that exact time. I heard over the walkie talkie, my girlfriend's full name needs to be escorted out of the building. I stopped dead in the hallway and the worst fear ran through my body. At first, I thought it was a hallucination, but my better wits told me it was very, very real. I was totally panicked. I started walking around the empty hallway searching for some sign that this was really happening, but I didn't find one. I started thinking that maybe something happened that didn't involve her tripping, but I blew that out of my mind. I was never so panicked in my life. I had no idea what to do. I started thinking that maybe this was a hallucination, but the fear still remained. From that point on to sixth period, I was getting visuals of police officers, which I knew was a hallucination. I was very scared. I thought I was going to have a very bad trip. During my lunch period, I saw my friend who was drug free and I told him I was tripping and he asked how I was doing. I told him I'm fine, but I think there's something wrong with Kay. She might be hurt, I don't know. He told me I'm tripping and to calm down. He treated me like a baby, like everything I was saying came from some insane person. I also saw a few of my other friends who knew I was tripping and knew Kay very well. I talked to them and they told me they heard that something happened with Kay. This reassured my worst fear. Most of them told me they heard rumors about people telling them that Kay was rolling so bad that she was biting her lips so hard it was bleeding. Others told me that something just happened to her. I was so scared. I decided to leave the cafeteria and go out to the courtyard and talk to my friend alone and see if he could reassure me or something. Well, it just so happened that there was also one of those officials out in the courtyard, and yes, he had a walkie-talkie on. This wasn't out of the ordinary at our school. I started hearing words from the walkie-talkie, and then, the worst part, I heard them say my full name. I totally freaked out. My friend called me down and said I might have just heard it, but then they said it again and he heard it. We went back to the cafeteria and our group of friends started talking and I told them what happened and asked them what to do and all. They helped me out a lot. I was still very much tripping. I went through my school bag, pocket, and everything and threw out everything I knew that had to do with drugs, all the notes from Kay that talked about us tripping, and even a dose container. It saved me a lot of trouble cleaning my school bag. I was never so nervous in my life. I walked to my last period class, but on the way there I saw a group of administrators in the hall. It was my grade level administrator, the principal, two police officers, and the head of the district. This was high school by the way. They immediately told me to step into the office. This was the end of me. I was never lower. I tried to remain calm, but it was hard. They brought me to a room and I sat down with them. They told me I'm in a lot of trouble. Of course, I played dumb thankfully. They started asking me if I gave anything to Kay today. Of course, I denied it. Then they started telling me about Kay, which blew my mind. They told me that during fifth period, her lunch period, she flipped out totally and had to be taken to the hospital and be restrained. They told me she was in very bad shape. Again, I denied all of their accusations that I was involved. They then looked into my eyes, which were all pupil. They asked me if I was under the influence of anything, and they tried to fool me into cracking under pressure. 
They messed with my mind, trying to get me to admit it, but luckily my defenses were up. At that point, they called my house. I live with my grandma, so that's who they talked to. They told her that I was probably under the influence of something and that I gave some kind of drug to my girlfriend and she's hospitalized. My grandma rushed to the school and blah blah blah. Bottom line, since I denied everything and when they searched my school bag they found nothing, I was set free. They didn't suspend me or anything, at least not yet, but I had to go for a drug test, urine and blood. It is now Sunday as I am writing this. Kay is out of the hospital, but the establishment she's living in is prohibiting me from ever seeing or talking to her again, and the school expelled her. I'm never going to see her again. Depending on the drug test results, which aren't looking too good, I might be suspended, or worse. I'm assuming that there is a search warrant for the house, so my brother is getting rid of the chemicals. I'm not sure if the establishment Kay lives in will press charges, and if I will have to go to court to defend myself. I found out today why this happened. My brother, Jay, gave us all extremely high doses. It was a mistake. He was tired and didn't measure right. I'm guessing from what he told me that me and F were on somewhere above 60 milligrams and K was on 45 milligrams. Her first time. I just wish I could turn back time to recover my love lost. So about two years ago, me and two friends, G and D, wanted to get together and trip one last time before I moved across the country. We had all just graduated high school and we were starting college. I had tripped with both of them multiple times and pretty much always had a good time. We would usually go camping, but it was fairly cold this time of year and D had a free apartment, so we were just gonna crash there. So to start the day, we all meet up at a nearby parking lot they said I could leave my car at and they drove me to the apartment. From the beginning, Something seemed really off about G. In hindsight, I should have asked what's up or something because I knew before he mentioned not wanting to take his medication because it prevents him from tripping, but at the time I trusted him and thought nothing more of it. We make it to the apartment and drop. D had a class he had to attend which he did while we were coming up and we all just started kind of giggling. We then put on Into the Spider-Verse and that was an intense experience. After that movie ended, we got kind of hungry so we ordered a pizza. D and I chose to get the pizza because G was starting to get even more quiet. I had a small talk with D as we were getting the pizza that G was acting a little strange and we assumed he was just having a little bit of a tough time. We brought the pizza back and G didn't eat anything and was generally starting to make me feel uncomfortable. I said we should put on Doctor Strange and that I could pirate it on his laptop and play it on the TV. While I was working on that, D started to get deep into the trip. He came over and kept messing with the laptop and generally being kind of a goof. This is when things took a turn for the worse though. G all of a sudden started yelling. I don't remember what, but I think it was about the movie not working. He started to get pretty angry and was speaking with a thick southern accent for some reason. He normally doesn't have any accent. As I'm trying to get the laptop to connect, he starts yelling, Who am I trying to kill? Over and over. I look at D and answer him with, Not your friends. That made him quiet for only a brief moment. After that, my memory starts to get a little fuzzy. I remember I was still tripping, but definitely on the come down after the first movie. Somehow though, after that brief silence, chaos ensues. G ends up holding a pair of scissors up to D's neck and is nearly digging into his jugular. I jump in and yank the scissors out of his hand, cutting my fingers up in the process. I yell, what the fuck? and then D darts to his room and locks the door as G chases him. I go back and sit on the couch because I'm just getting a little overwhelmed and just wanted to chill. G, not being able to get D, starts just absolutely destroying D's laptop, beating it into the ground and into pieces. I said, all right, yeah, sure, do that instead of hurting me or D. I start to scroll on my phone, assuming he's just taking his anger out on the electronics, and then all of a sudden, bang, I get knocked out from G throwing the TV at my head, fracturing my skull. I vaguely remember seeing just a dark void and that I had actually shot myself and was being punished. I assume I thought that because I was suicidal in the past. I remember feeling like I was trapped in a small box and seeing family and friends go by in the void outside the box. I accepted that I was being punished. Not long after, however, I was awoken by liquid around my head and upper body. 
At the time, I thought the fish tank, which was actually empty, had broken. In reality, I was in a pool of my own blood and covered by broken electronics in the pizza. I groaned a little due to the pain. Another mistake as G heard me. He was around the corner banging on D's door trying to get in, but as soon as he heard me, he came over and just started kicking the shit out of me and throwing more stuff on top of me. After a few minutes of that, I guess he got bored or thought I was dead and went back to D's door. I managed to get up and sit down on the couch covered in blood. I remember doing this, but I don't remember feeling anything. G eventually came into the room and saw me sitting on the couch. He grabbed the wire from the TV on the wall and came over to me and started to wrap it around my neck. All I could say is, oh, we're doing this now? Okay. He wrapped it around my neck a few times and then just started to pull as hard as he could. I obviously started choking and passed out pretty quickly. Eventually, I woke up again with the wire still around my neck and it was almost morning. We had started our trip a bit after noon. At this point, I was sobering up a little and I saw the absolute devastation of the apartment, but things weren't coming back to me that well. I went and took a shower because I was still covered in blood. At the time, I had no idea what it was until I stepped out and looked in the mirror. I had an absolutely massive gash in my head and bruises and scratches around my neck and all over my body. I started to panic as I still couldn't recall what happened that night. I also couldn't find my clothes and I walked out only in a towel and then I saw G with my blood all over his face. The moment I saw him again, I just told him to stay the fuck away from me. I may not have remembered much, but I knew whatever happened was his fault. He just kept asking me what happened and eventually handed me my clothes. I was just in jeans and had a towel for my head that was still somewhat bleeding. G went to look for D, and I just knew I wanted to get out of that place, so I went into the hallway of the apartment complex. I just sat on the floor and started crying, and then G came out looking for D and I. I told him D is in his room, and G tried to get back in, but we ended up locking ourselves out of the apartment. I kept crying and telling him that it was his fault. I was really fucked up, so I also kept going in a bit of a loop of forgetting what happened, and asking him if I shot myself, and him saying, yeah, it kind of looks like it and then me remembering that it was his fault. He keeps banging on the door to try to get back in while I keep hoping it's all a hallucination and will go away when he opens that door. Of course that never happened, but eventually someone down the hall heard him banging on the door and came to check it out. She saw me with no shirt and a towel over my head and him with blood on his face banging on the door. G and her talked. I didn't hear it because I just buried my face in that towel waiting for this to be over. Eventually the police and paramedics came. G told the police it was just a drunken fight and me not wanting to get in trouble just backed up his claim. When I actually got into the ambulance, I told him I was on acid. Fast forward a little and G was forced to pay me and D's medical bills but never got any charges. D stopped talking to me but apparently made a full mental recovery. I hate G so much for what he did to me. He showed no remorse and later that night just hung out with another person I thought was my friend. Later on, I actually found out that G thought D and I were government agents trying to psyop him and that there were listening devices in the electronics. I also kind of hate D now because he thought I told the police all the acid came from him and assumed I was throwing him under the bus and told everyone we knew that too. In conclusion, know who you're tripping with and if your gut tells you that something is off about someone, listen to it. <laughs>